ahead and begin. Welcome to the Nice Swanger Remote Learning Series uh, Roundtable Session titled Loosening the Knot, Common Threads in the Hybrid Classroom. Um, before we get started, if there's anyone who is not like a featured speaker um, or folks from, from Rural Life or the Nice Swanger Foundation, you can introduce yourself in the chat just so that we can see uh, who all is here. All right, so um, you all are probably uh, adept at Zoom by this point, um, but uh, just to just point out a couple of things that we might need to know during this session, um, you can mute and unmute as needed here, uh, as well as use the chat feature um, to ask questions. And uh, I'd like to introduce the roundtable facilitators. One, that's me, um, Brittany Siebert. I'm the Communication Dissemination Coordinator for Rural Life. Um, I've been at the Nicewanger Foundation for about a year. And before that, I worked at Columbia State Community College in Middle Tennessee for about eight years. And in that time, um, I taught uh, a variety of English courses, including online and hybrid courses. So I'm excited about what our uh, guests are going to share today regarding that. Um, and I will let my co-facilitator, Dr. Katherine Edwards, introduce herself if you don't know her already. Yes, thank you, Brittany. Um, again, I'm Katherine Edwards and I'm retired uh, teacher, librarian, and administrator. And I've been with Rural Life now, thanks to Richard Bales, for two years. And um, I'm loving it, loving it. And um, to all you administrators and teachers out there, I've often said I'm glad to be helping hands and not making decisions anymore. So, um, you know, glad to see all of you. All right, so we're gonna just review the session focus um, before we get started. We're gonna cycle through topics below as they relate to hybrid teaching and learning. Um, the first uh, topic that we'll look at is um, teacher preparation, just how we have prepared teachers to teach in a hybrid environment, regardless of the form that that takes. Um, I know just in the, the state of Tennessee and in, you know, just, uh, you know, our core district even, um, there are several, several uh, different models of, of hybrid instruction going on right now. So. Um, we'll look at that and then explore some best practice, what's worked, what hasn't, uh, shifting there from um, or to uh, how to build cohesion and maintain consistency, especially uh, for students and teachers. They desperately need that, right? Um, and it might seem uh, a little difficult to do when we have this sort of uh, what appears at times to be this tangled knot, right? Um, and lastly, we're going to look at uh, just moving forward, you know, how does this change um, what we view as a classroom, right? How has it evolved? Uh, and if you're joining us, and again, um, just as an attendee, if you have questions, you can go ahead and drop those in the chat. Uh, and um, Catherine and, and I will, will monitor the chat for those questions. All right, so now I'd like to introduce our featured guests. Um, well, maybe have them introduce themselves, right? Uh, but we have several people with us today representing a, a well variety of education um, levels and fields too. Uh, from teachers to leaders, um, community college instructors, university professors, and so on. So um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, let Dr. Timms maybe um, introduce yourself and we'll just kind of go around the table, okay? And uh, we'd like to hear, I guess, um, everyone's experience or association with the hybrid learning model. Great. So uh, my name is David Timms. I uh, currently in my 28th year. So um, been at this a while. Um, 
supervisor of secondary, which for us in Johnson City is mainly the high school, Science Hill, and instructional technology, K-12 in our district. And then I also teach adjunct at Milligan University, uh, mostly hybrid classes. So I, I'm on that side of it as well. And I came to our district, in fact, Dr. Bells brought me to this district five years ago, and we started a blended learning and personalized learning initiative from scratch. And so that's sort of what has built up to what we're doing in Johnson City Schools. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tiens and Dr. Benz Owens. Hi, thank you for having me here today. So um, I am a professor of communication studies at Columbia State. I just started, this is my 20th year, so Dr. Timms has some, a few years on me, but not a whole lot. Um, I first developed our online course for public speaking in 2004 and then moved into a hybrid format for that same course, which is now a, uh, a broader communication course. And that was about 10 years ago that I've been teaching in the hybrid format. And we do it as a short-term seven-week class, so it's pretty intensive. And I've had that experience, both good and bad. Thank you, Lacey. Um, we'll move on to Del Hobbs. Um, hey, yeah. Um, I teach mathematics courses at Columbia State myself. And I've uh, probably been teaching like some kind of distance learning slash um, online and hybrid courses for probably about eight years um, now. So, um, but yeah, we got into, I guess, like DBC or the video conferencing kind of stuff, the um, live stream probably about five years ago with a uh, video. So I've had quite a bit of experience with um, Zoom and um, other products out there. So, um, but yeah, I'm definitely wanting to con contribute some things here for, uh, for the round table for anybody that has questions about, you know, how to get into it or um, maybe some tips that you can use. Uh, Cause yeah, I've definitely been at it for a while now. <laughs> I feel like forever. <sighs> Thank you, Dale. Uh, Jessica. Hanson? Hi, um, I have been teaching uh, in some form of capacity, like anywhere from K through eight, special education, social studies, English to um, community college. And now I'm teaching at TSU um, as an assistant English professor. But I started out uh, in an odd way teaching as an adjunct with a co-teacher mentor who I still keep in touch with. And he um, literally was like an innovator in um, teaching and hybrid and it was really cool to learn from him. So now I've learned a lot of techniques and have hopefully incorporated them well into my classes over the years, but I'm excited to learn from everyone today and hopefully contribute some things as well. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Andrew Wright. Oh, unmute. <laughs> It's all right, Andrew. Under sooner or later. Um, yeah, I I've, uh, also teach mathematics at Columbia State. I'm going into my ninth year. Um, and I've uh, been teaching distance as well as hybrid for several years as well. Um, for about five years, I've actually been uh, teaching the accelerated hybrid courses, either seven week or 10 weeks in duration. And those are, those are pretty um, demanding for students. So um, I probably can, uh, can offer some insight into that sort of uh, learning environment for students as well. But um, thanks for having me today. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, is Brandy McLeod from Elizabethan City Schools. Hi, um, thanks for having me here today. I uh, teach 11th grade U.S. history. We are in our seventh week of hybrid teaching, and that's about my experience with hybrid teaching. Um, other than just being remote in the spring, um, I also do teach uh, adjunct for Northeast State and ETSU history, so I do that online but I feel like that's a very different dynamic than 11th grade. And then when you go down the ages. Um, so I'm hoping to learn a lot today. I don't know how long we're gonna be hybrid. Um, 
it's had its ups and its downs for sure. Uh, I was just talking to another teacher today and it feels like the teacher's knowledge is going this way and the student activity is going this way the longer it goes on. Um, so I'm definitely hoping to get some pointers and uh, make it the best that we can. Because I do think it's better than being all remote. So I'm trying to find that positive every day. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Brandy. And thank everyone again for, for being here today and, and contributing. Um, all right. So we will move on. And you don't have to add a response to the, to the chat. And I think we might have already untangled this definition a little bit. Um, about what hybrid teaching and learning looks like at your school or in your district. Again, I think we um, just listening to each um, featured guest today explain their experience in hybrid teaching and learning. It looks drastically different from the other. So we have this sort of buzzword that represents so many different things. Um, to so many different teachers and leaders. Uh, and in Tennessee, again, um, and I took this information just from the uh, new COVID dashboard that the Department of Ed has um, put up and reporting schools, uh, you know, we see just in the state of Tennessee, um, parent choice hybrid, whatever that, that means, right? And it means something different to each, you know, uh, district or, or school even. Um, and then also they have a uh, definition for hybrid alternating schedules and, and grade bands, right? And so um, we see, again, within the entire state of Tennessee, and then just the, the core district, which is Northeast Tennessee, um, how many schools are operating on the hybrid model or have and then maybe have have transitioned into um, in-person or something else. So various definitions there. All right, so uh, we're going to move on from there and just talk about some uh, some goals, kind of norm setting. Um, we want to learn from and with others at our table, uh, share success stories, but also some challenges in hybrid instruction, propose ways to overcome those challenges, try to focus on student-centered solutions when possible, um, maybe brainstorm how these successes, challenges, and solutions might look like in different contexts. And I think that'll be really interesting since we do have such a vast representation from, um, you know, uh, K through eight experience, um, secondary experience. We have leaders, we have university and community college professors at the table as well. So it'd be interesting. And uh, we also want to illustrate what that looks like through words, videos, lesson plans, whatever models we have available to us. All right, so we will go ahead and address our first topic, teacher preparation. And so one thing that um, we keep hearing is that many K through 12 teachers, they stated that this fall, it feels like their first year of teaching all over again. Um, and I wondered, uh, if you all could kind of speak to that a little bit. So whoever wants to contribute can. Well, I'll start. Um, I feel like this is something um, that I'm experiencing, definitely. Um, the way that we present information has to change because the format is changing, at least for me, half the week. Um, and teaching U.S. history, I have a very short amount of time to get a whole lot of information covered. And so we talked a lot about um, how to do that effectively with them gone three days out of the week. Um, we wouldn't be able to cover all our curriculum if we only taught two days. And so it's been a big learning curve um, in figuring out how to get them the same information without being bodies in my room because after the first couple of weeks, the student feedback I got was, please don't make me sit and watch another video. Please don't make me sit at home at my computer all day. Um, please don't make me watch lectures. And so there was a big learning curve to figure out what can I expect out of a 16 year old when they are left to their own devices. Um, and so 
we have had to recreate materials. We have had to go and find um, new activities, things that normally we wouldn't need for them to be pulled to do in the classroom. Um, and then when they are in class, we can't do the normal activities because you can't work in groups. Uh, you can't turn desks in a circle to have discussions. Most of my class is discussion based. So um, getting around all of that stuff has been, and then with the hybrid model also, some days I have 15 kids and then at the end of the week I have two. I have one class with two kids. Um, how do you get them to have an engaging classroom experience? Um, it's really difficult. So we have had to recreate pretty much every lesson and it's a constant night before making lesson plans that I haven't done since I student taught. <laughs> right, so uh, can anyone else, um, I know Brandy, she kind of talked about some of the, the challenges, yeah, that um, are presented when it's this brand new experience. So, um, you know, like Lacey, Andrew, Dale, Jessica, those of you who have taught hybrid for, you know, several, um, several years maybe, uh, even though you all are teaching maybe adult le learners, also high school students, dual enrolled students sometimes, right, in those situations. Can you all speak to that? Yeah, I can speak to it, and I have kind of a nuanced perspective anyway. I taught college at community college first and had taken online classes myself for several things, um, but then I went back and taught K through eight, and uh, my last you know, year of experience, I really relate to Brandy because I was going through uh, classes myself and we got turned into hybrid in the middle of the year and I was getting uh, certified for special education. Um, so doing that myself was totally different. Um, it was just a different way because I'd done stuff through D2L and Blackboard, but it was never completely online um, until last year. So it was kind of like at your own pace, things like that. So uh, going completely online um, and teaching completely online to special, uh, special education, uh, teaching exceptional learners uh, was unique. And I felt uh, like a brand new teacher, even though I taught at that point for eight years. So because uh, I wanted to accommodate all my students and I felt horrible, like they don't have internet access. Some of them didn't have a hotspot. Some had a laptop, but it would be, you know, not really great quality. And we would try to communicate and get them one as soon as possible. But if their families are living in poverty, that's not their priority, right? Is to go get a brand new computer. Um, so those were very much uh, like heartbreaking challenges to me um, to be going to school, really passionate about getting a special education degree and then feeling like you're failing your first year at it because having to um, do as best you can over Zoom or Nearpod. We learned like I feel like five different platforms throughout because they would not like how kids would interact with them so they would change it and that was more confusing for the students especially um, exceptional learners. It's just insane to change them in the middle when they barely got it you know for a month or whatever it was. <laughs> So, and now right. yeah, so definitely again some is, similar challenges. Teaching college again is, it feels like a breeze. I feel like I'm like getting like a cheat or something now after what I had experienced last year and what many teachers are still doing. So they still struggle with it as well because a lot of them are, they just left high school, but it's so different. So can, Brittany, I'll jump in on this one and sort of talk about real quick. In Johnson City, over the last five years, um, we've had a technology teacher leader program. It's cohort-based. Teachers apply every spring. We take 20 teachers um, every spring, and they go through a year-long Saturday Academy that we really focus in on pedagogy and um, strategies around good, solid, blended learning, as well as the tools. They then are embedded back in their schools to be a support. So we're five years into our teacher leader program. So we're now into the fifth cohort and they all return as um, embedded teacher leaders. So really when all of this happened, we just really activated this whole network of our teacher leaders. Uh, we already had the training, training framework in place. We already have technology academies that we had already uh, modeled over the last few years. In fact, we took the one this summer that we would have had in person with around 350 to 400 teachers virtual 
And we just had, instead of them being there live in person, they all recorded um, all of their sessions. And we're a Canvas district. We're five years in with Canvas LMS and we use Canvas Studio. So we now have this uh, array of 50, 60 sessions now that our teachers have been using and we've been adding to that as the school year goes on. So as far as teacher preparation goes, I, felt, I feel like in Johnson City, our teacher leaders have really been our backbone because we've had that going on for, um, for five years now. So almost a fifth of our teachers have gone through this year long academy and all of our professional development is sort of anchored in that along with our academic coaches in our district. So they've really tried to support the teachers. We have K-6 back in the classroom. Uh, 7-12 will be coming back after fall break, but we'll still have around 2,000 remote learners that we're serving in Johnson City. And our model is a little different. Um, all of our remote teachers are fully remote teachers. So they're delivering live instruction uh, along with uh, asynchronous video. They're not doing a teacher own model, except in a few high school AP classes. So that's sort of been our journey with uh, the teacher prep piece as well as um, the um, support piece with teachers. Now, again, this network of capacity that we've built over the last few years has been really crucial for us uh, in, in our district. Right, yes, yeah. so already having that scaffolding in place, um, I'm sure that, that Johnson City Schools have, and you know, if sort of anecdotal evidence is, um, you know, uh, it kind of speaks for itself. I've heard, you know, Johnson City Schools is, is the model, you know? Um, so I think having that scaffolding in place definitely contributed to that and to uh, people's comments, right, with that. Um, Let's see, Lacey, I saw that you had unmuted for a second. Did you have something to add? No, I, can I say I've been incredibly impressed by that system. That is absolutely amazing. We oftentimes, when it, when it comes to preparation, and this ties in the last question and this question, I do hiring for communication for our adjuncts at our school. And when I hire someone to teach the hybrid for the first time. I tell them every time, the first time you teach this, it's going to feel like a disaster. And so to speak to the, the two earlier, it, it is an, a huge change, even though you may be covering the same material, how you're covering it, um, it it's a challenge. And you constantly feel like you're trying to strike this balance. And pretty much every time that a, an instructor does teach it the first time, they come to me and say, I don't know if I can do that again, because it's incredibly stressful. And again, we have the seven week uh, accelerated, so it's a little bit tougher. Um, so I will add or say it does get better. <laughs> that usually the second time they teach it, they feel better. And then after those couple of times, they get into the groove and they get things figured out. Um, and so one thing that I've been trying to tell our faculty this semester is we don't expect you to be perfect. This is new for a lot of our faculty and it is a process and I always try to give grace and I do give students grace as well. And so I know that we are much luckier. Like you said, teaching in higher ed, it's an entirely different ball game and we have a lot of leeway that, uh, and a lot of outs, I think, that you don't see in the K through 12. So the K through 12 folks, y'all are the rock stars. And um, we can share what we've done, but I think that there are a lot of challenges that even I can't even begin to address because of that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel uh, the same way on the end of Lacey's statement. I haven't had near the experience with that um, area of students like the high school level students but I do I've been doing this eight years now and I still don't feel like I've got the distance slash remote learning things down perfect but yeah the first time you, definitely you're prepping a lot of stuff you know like that you used to you do in class but now you have to do it at a distance like you may have had an activity that you do in class well now you have to like either modify it find a simulation online that people can do in like little breakout rooms um you may have to make little Kahoot quizzes or, or Socrative quizzes. Um, so your students have something like where you can get, you know, feedback, like, are they getting this? Are they understanding what I'm teaching? Um, that first year though, yeah, of teaching, 
uh, or the first time you teach these uh, hybrid slash online classes, you are prepping a lot of stuff. It is uh, like Brittany, that question, like, you know, people feel like it's the first time they've taught. Yeah. I can see that for sure, but it gets easier, I guess, is the thing I will say. Um, it is rough the first time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just have to practice and, and it definitely, I have a lot, you know, I don't know in history how the notes work for you, but I, I, for a lot of narrative stuff, I create little like guided notes for them. So I don't have to like write a bunch of stuff or I just work out basic, like pro I do math problems. So I have the problems where we kind of work them out together. Um, Fortunately for me, I have like a tablet I write on. So some stuff I've like simplified so that it's not so boring for the students like to take all these notes um, for the stuff that I teach. But there are little things, like I said, where you, you get better at developing materials over time. But yeah, the first year, I remember it was rough for me too. Right. And uh, let's see. Catherine, did you have a question for Dr. Yeah, Smith? I did. Actually, David jumped in and I had a question for him because Johnson City has been in from what I understand the most seamless as far as take, taking this and running with it. But I wanted it to It sure know, doesn't feel that way. <laughs> oh, it is true. It is true. And even in our coaches meetings, you know, with we have talked about some of that. But have you uh, and I would be interested on the on the community college and college level also. And Brandy, do the administrators ever come back, or uh, do teachers have a way to to vent? Or, or what are you doing with frustrations? Um, there's, and I can speak to this because I've seen it. There's all kinds of different training and and things going on out there. Johnson City teachers were probably uh, a a whole lot more well trained and the expectations even last spring was to continue the best you can maybe more so than other places so are you are you do the teachers have and the instructors have a way to vent and talk to you about problems i mean have you had to deal with any of that so um i use our teacher leader network uh for that piece they pass issues up to me and we've got one district instructional technology coach who works under me. Um, also, the full-time remote teachers we've been bringing in on a regular basis, because once the kids came back, this was a very interesting aha for me. And my wife is a fifth grade teacher in Johnson City. And um, I, I've been watching, she's in an in-person classroom. When the kids came back, the support we had to provide to our remote teachers didn't really have to do with the technology. It did not have to be, uh, it didn't have to do with their access to uh, tools. I walked from a third grade classroom where the teacher was introducing her kids to each other to a classroom next door where the teacher was sitting alone in the corner of her room with her screen city set up waiting for her third graders on remote to log in. It's been the emotional and the uh, collegial support that we've really had to provide that's been a big aha to us as leaders. Uh, to make sure that we're providing to those remote teachers. So that was a big aha once everyone came back off of full remote. You know, when everyone was on full remote, everyone was in the same boat. But they don't have those, and teachers feed off of kids. K-12 teachers feed off of kids. So Catherine, that's been huge. And, and um, you know, I'll, it's simple. It's being out in classrooms. It's just being out in classrooms and listening to teachers and being willing to be try to try to be responsive to what you're hearing. But that piece with the the mental and the emotional support was was a big aha. Yeah, I'll say um, if we didn't have kids here four days a week, um, this would be pretty miserable. Um, we have Wednesdays as our virtual day uh, and it always seems like I can't wait till Wednesday. And then by the end of Wednesday, we're all like little zombies. Uh, walking around. Um, and I think that for me personally, the kids have been my emotional support. So I've had kids in my classroom say, Ms. McLeod, I just cried yesterday because this was so hard. And I said, me too. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Um, and we have really good administration here that has tried to absorb a lot of um, issues that are coming in so that the teachers aren't getting hit with parent issues at the same time um, as all this other stuff that we're dealing with. Um, and so I do really appreciate that. I think it's important to have 
that support. Um, and that being said, that Wednesday is kind of a sad day. We all said, are, if we ever lose this now, like, what are we ever going to do? Um, because it has become important. Here, we have a little bit of a different model. Um, we all have a virtual class on top of our regular hybrid classes. So we're kind of doing three things at once. Um, and so this is a good opportunity for us to catch that work on Wednesdays with our virtual class as well, so. Hmm. Thank you for sharing everyone. Um, it, again, um, teacher preparation, we can see the uh, sort of runs the game, but you know, um, and even those who do have that, uh, that foundation in place, like, you know, Dr. Tim said, it seems like you're still scrambling in a way, right? Uh, so we're going to um, move on uh, from teacher preparation to um, best practice. And I know several of you have already shared um, a few things that you've, you've been doing in your hybrid class regardless of the uh, form that it takes or the structure that it takes. Um, but one question that we, I know at Rural Life um, and the Nice Ponger Foundation in general keep hearing from teachers, especially those who have students simultaneously online and in the classroom is what does student engagement look like in a classroom like mine? What's it supposed to look like? And so um, does anyone want to want to take a, a stab at that one? <laughs> So, uh, you get, Catherine, you can take my talking chips away when you want to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something that we stumbled upon uh, in, in our district, and this may be something you could share with the, the other schools, uh, is the ability of Zoom to um, mirror uh, through certain uh, digital projectors. If you have one of the digital pens and they're, they're like 60, 70 bucks, so uh, two of our high school uh, calculus teachers figured this out and we've been spreading it far and wide. There is the whiteboard feature in Zoom that allows, uh, if you've got this digital pen, what you're writing on the, uh, the, the board in your classroom for your students who are in the classroom will mirror on Zoom for those students who are at home. And then the teachers are also, like I've got the box of everyone here he is, well, it's a lot of them now, are mirroring that up in the, uh, on the board so that the students in the classroom can see the students that are at home. And uh, that has increased engagement tremendously. And it has also alleviated a lot of worries from teachers we heard initially who said, how will I manage behavior in the classroom as well as at home? Now, we're only doing that model at the high school. Uh, because K-8 is all either you're in remote or you're in person. But in, uh, I think we've got 63 different classes that we couldn't offer remotely. So we're allowing this uh, hybrid option. And that has spread like wildfire to be able to just capture the use of the technology you already have with learning a little bit better how to use some of those features of Zoom. Right. And I, I think I actually have this question in, in a different topic, but um, just how do you maintain sort of a, a sense of not necessarily like a normal classroom environment, but how do you, you know, how do you, you um, kind of adapt it, I suppose. And that's, that's one way. Yeah. So um, in terms of best practice, aside from um, what Dr. Timms has just um, kind of given us uh, what's worked in um, your all's classrooms, what hasn't? Um, have you been seeing student engagement change at all? So one of the things that I have tried to do, and you could argue whether it's been successful or not, but I try to do a flipped classroom. And so again, I think that this is a little bit easier at the college level because I can usually count on our students to do what they need to do outside of class. Uh, and so I, it, it makes it a little bit different. But I put 
lectures, uh, lecture outlines. I, I will usually double up. I do a lecture outline that's just written. I use the PowerPoint and I will create a video and post that online. And I tell them they pick, but they need to look through that. And then when they come to class, then we're doing small group activities. And I use the breakout rooms and we do discussions to where I sort of force them to talk and that helps. To, to keep them engaged. Of course, you always have those few who just will not engage at all. And it's frustrating trying to get those in. The breakout rooms, I think have worked better for anything else for me. So when they go out into the smaller rooms, they are more likely to interact with their classmates. And I hop into each one. And then when I come back or when we come back as a group, they are able to participate with the group. And it feels, I think, a little bit less scary for them. And so that has been really helpful. If I just sit and lecture, they do start to tune out. That being said, there are days when you just have to sit and lecture. So it's a, it's a balance to try to figure out what actually is going to work and what doesn't. Um, and I try to prioritize content versus application and activities. And it's not always easy to do. Right. And this, uh, this flip classroom model, I know it's been done in, in like, uh, the lower grades before, but, um, anyone, you know, a guest here today, have, do you have any experience, um, in the flip classroom? Maybe Jessica, do you have any experience in that? So oh, I guess, uh, what do you mean by like the flipped classroom? Ms. Finn? Uh, oh, it's, a, it's similar to what, what Lacey um, was just saying she does at the community college level where um, you prepare materials but the, like beforehand um, and then while you are either teaching online um, as a part of, you know, straight up virtual learning or as a hybrid model, um, you use that time for well, again, at community college, it'll be discussion, right, in breakout rooms, but how, how might we, um, again, adapt that, like, to a, 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 in the lower grades, maybe K through three, um, do you have any experience with that, or? No, I think I was trying to be, like, what Dr. Tim said, and monitor what I, all I said, because I have had experience teaching kindergarten through eighth grade, and then community college, and, and now, uh, university, so I was trying to not monopolize, but, um, so with definitely not the lower grades, I'd never had done hybrid at all with K through fifth, I would be useless to ask advice on that. But I understand because I have tons of friends who have younger children right now and they're really struggling with like, hey, I have none of their work is due until Sunday, but they have to do every single day this huge amount of work or you know, I think they tried to like differentiate like uh, I'll do like part of it one week we'll do every day and it was overwhelming. So then they were like, what if I don't let them do work every day and make them do it like two days a week? And she was like, I could never, they would never get it done for like a third grader or a fifth grader if they were trying to um, do what I guess Brandy had mentioned about like go three days a week and then two days take off just the amount of work. And I saw that from the charter model. I've only worked in public school with charters for five years and they were very, non-flexible which is why they did not have as good of luck as what johnson city had because they thought we're knowledgeable and we have all the answers but then when it came down to doing hybrid learning they did not and they were inflexible and i had a lot of experience from community college from tutoring at different programs and from teaching university but they wouldn't let us try anything they were like well you're gonna get zoom bomb so we're not gonna use zoom we're just gonna use uh Google Classroom. The kids couldn't get Google Classroom. So then uh, we tried to do Nearpod, but that's really hard when they can't see it live in the moment with you. Because if they don't understand something, they have to email you or call you or whatever method. So we tried to tell them. So I, for lack of a better term, um, just did what I wanted. Because <laughs> I always like, I would rather ask for apologies, you know, than permission sometimes. Because I want the kids to get the learning, not you know, worry about myself getting in trouble. So I would uh, contact parents and say, if you are comfortable, can we still do a private Zoom, especially with special needs students? So we would do a private Zoom. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be able to access the material. So that I found a lot of luck with 
Nearpod. I don't know if you all are familiar with Nearpod and Zoom at the same time. I love Nearpod. It's much more interactive because they could do all these um, like boards where they can post things kind of like chats and then it's interactive, but it's not intimidating where they have to talk unmute or whatever. Um, and then there's another uh, app that we use this summer with this tutoring program I do, uh, Why We Can't Wait. It's called Seesaw and it's another really interactive website that like they can interact by submitting videos of themselves or they can type something or do like a mic answer versus answering in the moment or typing it out, especially again, I keep saying special needs students, but um, you know, they have an, an, a lot of intimidation and self-consciousness. Like I don't wanna talk on the camera or um, I'm not comfortable typing something because I'm afraid I'm going to make a bunch of grammatical errors. So that helped a lot, giving them so much more flexibility, what they needed. And that, you know, is similar for every learner, whether it's K through college. So I just feel like schools need to be more flexible because it doesn't, everything doesn't work for all students or all teachers. And I feel like, yeah, I'll be quiet. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I was just raising my hand because... Um, that for Brad, I thought you were saying like you have five seconds. Be quiet. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! You just spurred a lot of. There was some chat going on from what you were saying. Brandy lo, uh, uses uh, Jamboard, which okay. great, you know, for like for for to get kids to exit tickets or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, uh, um, let's see what else was uh, Bethany. What are some of the other things that we've talked about? Besides Jamboard and um, Flipgrid is a, a video related, similar to the Seesaw uh, example. Yeah, I have seen, I was up in, um, um, I won't say the name of the county, but it's where Dr. Timms is from, that they, they have really struggled with, you know, there's, there's access problems who, you know, the haves and the have-nots in the K-12, you know, in the community college and the college, they, they come on board knowing some expectations. But, you know, I have really seen some teachers really, and they've asked me, you know, uh, Catherine, how can, uh, how can I keep kids engaged? You know, they, they, they're, they're logging in from their bed in their hoodies and, you know, and it's, um, it's been really heartbreaking to see that with teachers. Um, I don't know. I mean, David, did you all have any kind of code of conduct or anything that, you know, and I really feel like we're helping all these kids get ready for community college and, and university life. So I won't talk about spring because that was survival mode, but going yeah. into fall and, and we've got it posted on our website and, and we've shared it um, with, with other districts. We actually wrote a, uh, student and parent uh, remote learning manual for the fall. It's, it's not long. It's about 18 pages. Page 15 is the page that I quote all the time. It is what gets you removed from remote learning. Uh, it's the expectations for both parents and families. We designed in Canvas an open parent course that the parents had to complete. Uh, and they had to understand Seesaw and K1. They worked through a module. They had to understand Google Classroom for one, two, and then we're Canvas third grade and up. They had to work through, sign up as a parent observer, do all those type things to uh, be admitted into the uh, remote learning program. I know that I say that in gray space because our, our board attorney, who's also our HR director, we knew we had to let them in, but um, we still put all these parameters in place. Uh, the biggest thing that we've done, um, Catherine, is you've got to make sure that you've got people on staff that are still gonna go out and deliver paper materials. Our librarians who I supervise, we've, all, we've got a procedure in place to get library books out on a regular basis to those kids. We've got a way to get work back from those kids. It's paper-based. Uh, you've gotta have people knocking on those doors. You can't let those remote kids disappear who are not engaging. And I know that makes us very different from, uh, from higher ed, um, but you, you've got to have something in addition to, and we used a lot of our CARES money to buy hotspots and we gave hotspots to anyone who needed a hotspot. So we tried to remove all those barriers, and, but that also still included knocking on doors. And um, Dr. Anderson, one of our other supervisors, uh, gave me pretty much our entire pot of Title IV money. And that is what I use at the high school, our Title IV money to really target those at-risk students. And we're doing a lot of door knocking and a lot of uh, communication with parents 
and keep pulling them along. Because if we don't pull them along during this time, we will never let them recover. We'll never get them to a place where they can recover. Yeah, we've had a lot of, after the first four or five weeks now, uh, students that were distance learners are now coming in and the parents are saying, yeah, we really want them to come back to school instead. Um, so we have our faculty, our administration has been allowing a lot of fluidity between the two. Um, because we had something similar to Johnson City with like a manual um, that parents had to sign and students had to sign. Um, but there's still been a lot of them coming back and saying, well, I didn't know it was going to be like that. I think they thought it was going to be a lot like spring when we were all were just like our hair is on fire. Um, and a lot of them were able to sort of just slide through. Um, and now there's accountability. We have attendance every day that they have to check in with us those types of things that now they're like, oh, I'm not just going to be able to lay in bed all day um, and, you know, check out. So we have had quite a few that are returning to traditional learning models. So um, I don't think that's because what we're doing isn't working. I think it's because they realized they weren't going to be able to do it that way. It's hard. So we'll uh, follow up that with um, moving to our topic on cohesion and consistency, providing just, again, a sense of normalcy, but some sort of consistency for students and teachers during all these shifts and transitions this fall and beyond. So um, I thought we might speak a little bit about just classroom dynamics, how those have changed, which I think we've already uh, addressed that here, there. Um, and those barriers and so on. So we can elaborate on, on that. Anybody wants to jump in? I'll just say my kids are happy to be here um, when they're only here two days a week. Um, they're, those two days are um, really engaging. Um, the, I don't see the burnout that I've seen. So um, I feel like I'm trying to find those positive things that are occurring because of the hybrid schedule uh, for teenagers. That's one of them, um, that they are energized and ready to go for those two days they're here mostly. Um, and we are adapting, like we can't do oral discussions because of distancing. So we are doing a lot of silent discussions. I mentioned Jamboard. Um, if you allow students to be editors, they can post post-it note comments and have a discussion. Um, we had to have a long ethics talk about not, not posting, you know, things inappropriate, but I've done four of them and they've all been seamless. So, I mean, I think if you give kids grace and give them um, a little bit of trust, which is hard sometimes as an educator, then they will overwhelmingly surprise you, especially in, in this situation. Um, you, all the higher ed people, are the are your all students back on campus all the time, or are they getting to choose hybrid versus classroom? I, I don't know that. So ours got a choice, um, but the professors did not get a choice. So um, we have obviously a lot of tenured faculty who were not happy with that and they voiced it to their students and um, told them, my boss also was like very much, um, I, I want to say a little too lenient or maybe too open. So it like opened the floodgates of I'm going to kind of do what I want now. So uh, he was like, you know, you can make make them come on for 15 minutes a day, tell them their assignments and tell them to go every day because it's uh, when it was asynchronous. And then um, he said, or, you know, you can lecture the whole time. And I, I don't lecture the whole time. I've never been like that, even in the classroom. I think that's so boring, but um, I do want to keep as much consistency as possible. And I think having this like community college, K through eight and college, it just gave me such a different outlook because if I had never taught K through eight, I would not have been a good teacher in college when I went back because the, especially with this, the uh, interaction and the uh, expectation of them to really continue to be responsible for their own education in college, especially when some of them started 
well ended, you know, their high school career in digital world to start college like that. They were so unmotivated, like this is not what I wanted. I was, you know, striving before for sports or academics and I was wanting to be in the band in college and have this college experience. So I had to like make it as fun as possible. So we do this every single day. Uh, I give them like an Excel document shared where they have a attendance prompt and it's like something to get us talking about either struggles that they're having or something fun, something positive to have like a fun interaction at the beginning. Um, and then we've talked about also like college decorum, the same problems, laying in bed, everything still applies to college. So, and even more so because, you know, it's not like uniform or anything, but um, I have students that are literally taking class in McDonald's or Starbucks where they can get Wi-Fi or on the bus. They're taking, you know, they're, but I just, I, with college, I guess it's a little easier to say like, you have to turn your Zoom camera on, you have to interact. Um, but I try to make it fun and I have like humor and everything anyway to keep things light with such a dark time. So I feel like um, some of them were like, oh, some of my professors don't make me come to class ever. And I was like, yeah, but I want you to have the real college experience as much as possible. So the consistency every day has been really um, impactful. And plus, I guess, again, it sounds very K through eight, but I shout them out all the time and say like, oh, you have great attendance or, you know, you're participating. And they actually are like, you're the only teacher that does that in college. All the others are just like, do whatever you want. And then they don't have anyone come to class. But that's why I think because there's no consistency. Right, yeah. And um, just in, in some research, I've been looking at uh, a lot of uh, K through three, especially um, teachers are doing those morning messages, I guess, to maintain consistency. So something that, you know, I guess that's how we could adapt it to, to that. Um, just, uh, I saw folks doing the morning messages. I, I saw one video of a teacher dressed up as ketchup. I'm just, you know, just to get the students there and engaged and, um, different, uh, you know, um, I, I guess like getting, uh, keeping them sort of entertained, we'll say. Um, so from, from that sort of lighter, I guess, perspective, moving forward, um, looking at uh, learning gaps. Catherine, do you want to take, take the reins here? Yeah, um, I do. And I know we're, we're closing in on the end of our time. But um, Tracy from um, the um, Sevier County, she had to sign off, but she said that uh, their concerns and that, that her system were the gap closures. And um, so her district assessed each of the students with, uh, and, and then, you know, made sure that the teachers, the new teachers this year saw the gaps and knew what they were. And it was useful if the teachers took the opportunity to analyze it and, you know, and use that information. But I guess with, with where we're moving, I'd like to hear from everybody about, you know, if, if normal happened tomorrow, everybody was back in the classroom 100%, how has this pandemic, how has hybrid learning, online learning, how has it changed uh, your world? And will we ever go back to what we knew this time, this time today, last year? And uh, I have my own thoughts on it. And I like to think that I'm still with it a little bit. I don't, and I, I'm certainly saying, seeing in systems that I work in, there will be virtual days, not snow days. And I think, praise the Lord on that one. But I would like to hear about where, what we've been through and everything, how everything has changed. What do you think, how, how has that impacted or changed your world in your world? I, I, I would uh, say for, for me, it has um, increased my awareness of students, um, I guess, ju just where students are in terms of, uh, for, uh, and, and specifically I'm talking about um, students 
in math classes that don't like math, don't feel like they're good at math anyway. Um, so it's it's kind of forced me to be more more empathetic, I guess, with students and to be more understanding um, of where they are, their their status, their progression, um, or lack thereof, and to um, be more uh, conscientious of perhaps the the kind of uh, support that the additional support that they need in order to be successful. I think for us, and, and we've talked a lot about it, the, this, that we've, it's really been a paradigm shift, I think, in K-12. And we can either be, continue being reactive or we can pivot to being proactive. And I know in, in our district, I've already asked the board, um, you know, for their blessing. And in January, I'll be giving them uh, an, a developed plan for a 3 through 12 virtual academy for next year. We're going to go ahead and just go full in and be ready for this because we know there's a lot of parents uh, who will want that option. The other piece though that it has um, emphasized on up us is the power of video and the power of teachers being able to capture either through recorded or live uh, video what's going on in the classroom to post online for those students who are absent. It's forever going to change absenteeism and I think it's forever going to change a lot of the ways that we offer public K through 12 education. Yeah, from the teacher side, um, paper is gone pretty much, which is kind of a nice thing. I'm not making copies on copies because we have not been a one to one district. We will be after we get our next Chromebook uh, push out in October. Um, but most kids are bringing devices and things like that. And so it's been a big change. Um, in that respect that I'm thinking more digitally. Um, we have teachers that have jumped in both feet uh, that really were scared of digital learning that now are teaching each other things. Um, and so I think it proves the resiliency of K-12 teachers as well. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, no more snow days. I've, I've told my students that, um, but it has helped with like missing work also, um, because if they are absent, I can say, hey, it's on Google Classroom. You go back to that day and pull it up and you can still do the work. Um, so that is one positive. It's taken something else off of our plate of making copies and circling back around and make sure these kids are doing stuff. And, and also, uh, I've kind of, that, that, that's going along with what you said, Brandy. Um, well, first of all, in higher education, we've had quite a few uh, faculty members that, you know, up until now have refused to use technology and, and to even teach online. And so um, we're seeing a lot of forward progress um, with those faculty members, which, which is very good um, because that way the brunt of, you know, teaching online and, and, and being, being tech savvy or whatever doesn't fall on a select few. Um, but also uh, I've seen where ju just, just the, um, the presence of technology or the requirement of having to use technology with students, it, to, to me, I, I've, I've kind of seen um, an area of interest um, kind of rise up with students. I mean, in the, in the advanced math classes, I've, I've always seen that with students, but now in, in teaching some of the more lower level math classes, I can see students' interest a, a little more um, in terms of, you know, having to use technology because, you know, that this younger generation, they've, they've grown, grown up with technology. Um, so I, I think they feel fairly comfortable for the most part. Um, so yeah. Right, well thank you. Um, it's it's 445 and unfortunately we have to have to cut the conversation short, but I want to thank all of you all for participating today um, and and sharing your knowledge, your experience. Um, I, I hope that folks you know watching the the recording of this 
um, learn something. I know they will. Uh, again, just thank you. Thank you. And thank you for what you do as educators and administrators as well. Um, if you want to access the recording of this, uh, you can go to our website and view session materials under the Loosening the Knot uh, session um, uh, square there. And um, are we going to, I guess we can still do the evaluation. Um, John, I think, or Bethany one, um, will drop an evaluation link in uh, the chat if you'd like to fill it out. Um, it helps us just, you know, improve essentially, right? So um, don't feel any pressure to, to fill it out, but you can, of course. Um, all right, and again, thank you all for, for being here. Hey, Brittany, here. can I do a shameless plug for yes, some of the other Yes, do a plug. Well, the rural coaches, along with uh, Learning Edge, our, our um, Bethany, what would you call them? They're our learning partners from North Carolina. Yeah, We've done a whole fall series learning, and it's been heavy on virtual. Everything from, from checks for understanding to social emotional learning, um, and it's all there. And uh, I know the coaches plan on using when we at when we're asked to do uh, professional development PD and stuff. You know, we'll go back to that. But there are some really really good strategies and some good practice, some good pedagogy uh, on our website that um, people have very seriously researched and presented. So that's my shameless plug for my colleagues. Thanks, Catherine. All right. So before we depart, anyone have any any other um, comments, questions, concerns? We're good. All right. Again, thank you all.